Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to our Hanafi Fiqh class. We are doing the kitab known as Ala Sunan of Mulana Zafar Ahmad Thanbi, Rahimahullah. And tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we are continuing on from the chapters regarding the leftover waters. And previously, last week, we had entered into the chapter regarding the leftover water of dogs. So we are continuing on from that chapter. So without any extra delays, let's begin. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. <clears throat> so we are starting on the top of page 291. We're starting here. An Ata, an Abi Huraira, radiallahu anu, an al kana ida walaga al kalbu fil inai, ahrakahu, wa rasalahu, salatam ra. Rawahu dar kutni wa isnadu sahih. آثار السنن قلت وردار قطني والتحاوي ذلك عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أيضا قولا وإسناده صحيح كما مر عن آثار السنن أيضا. So starting with the first uh, the narration the first narration over here is from Imam Atta from حضرة أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه who said that إذا ولا غلك كان أنه كان the, the practice, now he's speaking about uh, the practice of Hadrat Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, that when a dog used to leak uh, or drink from a container, he would pour out the, the water, and he would wash it thalatha marat. He would wash it three times. I think I mentioned this last week, but if not, and I was mentioning it elsewhere, then the rule is, or at least I think I mentioned it last week in class, that Hadrat Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is the narrator of the hadith with regards to washing uh, the, uh, a thing seven times. So now, if you have a, a uh, the Sahabi himself narrating that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said you must wash seven times, one time with sand, all that sort of stuff. Yet when he came to his personal practice, he washed three times. Then what did it show you? I, if you, either you are Shia Kafir and you believe the Sahaba rejected the Sunnah and they did their own thing, or you say no, there's actually a, the real ruling is that uh, okay, just one second here. Yeah. Okay, so the, either the, you say that Hadrat Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, like many times with other Sahab radiallahu anhu, that they somehow, for some reason, turned away from the Sunnah, which is the Shia Kafir type beliefs. Otherwise, the other thing is that the real ruling is contrary to what people tend to think. So now you look, where is this hadith reported? First thing, Imam al-Dara Qutni rahimahullah is the narrator of this hadith, but it's not who sahih, and the chain of narration is authentic. Now, sometimes people get the wrong idea and they think Imam Bukhari's sahih is the most authentic. Yes, as far as a collection is concerned, as far as the sanad is concerned, nobody denies that. But a sanad may be authentic in Bukhari, but the hadith is abrogated. So that's to a point that tends to go over the heads of people. So they think that if there's a hadith in Bukhari and it contradicts the hadith elsewhere, the other hadith might be thrown aside and the one in Bukhari might be followed. But the reality is far removed from that. Hence why you can find the Sahihain will mention the narration of washing seven times or eighth time with sand and beginning or end and all that sort of stuff. And yet, in the personal practice, what an authentic chain that Hadrat Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu only washed three times. Now, let me read the rest of the chapter finish and then I'll come and explain it in conclusion. So he says that uh, Imam Zafar Ahmad Thanbi, he says that Imam al Dara Qutni and Imam al Tahawi, rahimahumallah, both of them reported from Hadrat Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu as well as a statement. Uh, and the chain of narration is authentic, like how it was just previously mentioned here from Athar Sunan. So in this case here, it's a practice, a physical act that he poured the water out and he washed it. In the, there were no speaking involved. Adrat Abu radiallahu anhu poured out the water and he washed it three times. So a, narrate, a person was watching him and he narrated this. And in another narration, which both Imam Tara Qutni and Imam Tahawi reports, Adrat Abu radiallahu anhu physically, uh, or at least uh, verbally said that if a dog leaks in your container of water, pour it out and wash it three times. So he said it by words, he did it by action. Both of it contradicting the hadith of washing seven times. Like I say, hold that thought for now. It will be clarified shortly. 
Moving on, hadith number 251. An ibn Jurajin, qala qala li a'ata rahimahullah. Yukhsilu l-inaw al-lazhi walagha al-kalbu fihi, qala kullu thalika sab'an wa khamsan wa thalatha marrat. Rabahu Abdul Razak fi musanna fihi wa isnaduhu sahih. Imam ibn Juraj, he said, Imam a'ata asked me the question that if the container or the the water where a, where a dog drank from, is it to be washed? So he, he said that Kullu dhalika, all of that has been reported seven times, five times, three times, or wash it seven times, wash it five times, wash it three times. In other words, do whichever way you want to take it, whether you want to take it three, five, or seven, it's up to you. In other words, so what is the same? You can wash it, you see, minimum three, five, or seven. It's up to you how many you want to wash, but in other words, that's how uh, Imam Apa took it. But let's, uh, uh, Imam Abdul Razak reports this in Imam Sunnaf, and the chain of narration is authentic. Let's read the last hadith of the chapter. Yes, last one of the chapter, and then put everything in perspective. So hadith number 252. Ana Abdullah ibn Mughafal, radiyallahu anhu, qala, amara Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi qatli al-kilab. Thumma qala, ma baaluhum wa baalu al-kilab. Thumma rakhasa fi kalbi al-sayri wa kalbu al-ghanami. Wa qala, idha walaga al-kalbu fi al-inai, faghsiluhu sab'a marrat, wa'afiruhu al-thaminata bil-turab. Rabahu Muslim. So Hadrat Abdullah ibn Mughafal radiyallahu anhu, he said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave a command to kill the dogs. And this was a, 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 for a time period in Islam that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, kill dogs. And then the Sahaba radiyallahu anhu were literally killing the dogs. And then a time came and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, okay, sound is low. Can anybody else confirm the sound? If it is low, you can see if I can adjust the sound a little bit higher. <clears throat> okay, my thing is actually showing that the sound is supposed to be quite high. If anybody else could uh, please confirm if the sound is actually low or is it just showing high on my end? Anyone at all? Testing one, two, three. Is there anybody who's actually hearing me? Or am I speaking to myself over here? Test one, two. This sounds, according to my computer, sound is supposed to be perfectly fine. So, okay, anyway, carry on, let's uh, carry on where we were. So, Hadrat Abdullah ibn Mughafal radiallahu anhu, he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded that dogs be killed. Now, I was explaining that this was it for a period of time. And thereafter, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma baaluhum wa baalu al-kilab. What's the people and uh, the, the killing uh, and, the, and the dogs? You know, what's the issue with the dogs? Then uh, another narration, which isn't mentioned here, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, leave the dogs, but kill every pure black one. So at, at the first point, it was a general command, kill all the dogs. And then it was kill only the black one. And then you'll find other things to say, even the black ones were to be left because the black one was now a shaitan and that's why they were being killed at that time. And afterwards it fell away. But anyway, that's a, a different topic. For now, we're focusing on the ruling regarding the uh, saliva of the dogs. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what's with them and the dogs? So, uh, in other words, leave the killing of the dogs now. So obviously you, you the hadith you're preferably speaking about, even if you want to take black dogs as being acceptable or not, at the end of the day, it's not the, or at least I should say, if you want to talk about dogs, then stay away from the, the pure black ones. But I should add in this point here is that Everybody today has become a common thing. Dogs are not permissible in Islam as a general rule. But today, everybody who is have been taken in by kuffar ways, and it's like, but dogs are nice, and you know, uh, I like dogs, and this about dogs, and dogs are loyal, and this dog is a man's best friend. No, maybe it's a kafir's best friend, not the Muslim's one, but you know, and things of this sort. And children want to play with puppies and, and things like this. Yeah, and you're like, this is not the, the upbringing of a Muslim. When you follow that road, then you can't complain when 
you want to play with puppies like them you want to go to a nightclub like them you want to drink the wine like them you want to take drugs like them you want to commit zina like them a muslim we have our own way we don't follow their way and their lifestyle so doesn't mean we go around and we oppress dogs kick a dog when you pass by no you treat even if you were to pass a pig and a pig is it was impure than a dog but the thing is that you will treat the pig with kindness if a pig is uh, laying there hungry or thirsty about to die and you say let it die it's a pig then you will still be taken to task for it because Allah is the creator of that pig nobody's asking you to eat the pig but you don't uh, cause harm to any creature any creation of Allah anyway coming back to the point here so Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now gave a ruhsa a, you know the, the leeway with regards to what? في كلب الصيد for a hunting dog وكلب الغنم and a dog uh, for your sheep you know your your as a shepherd you have your dog to keep your uh, flock in order to chase away uh, snakes and other creatures and stuff of the sort here and to prevent the uh, uh, sheep on the corner from running off somewhere so the dog keeps them in, in a check so for that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave me permissibility. But not the uh, for a dog to have as a pet. And here's another thing. When you have a dog for of, of this type, another one you can also include inside here is a dog for protection. You've got a, as you'll find in other narrations now, you've got a big uh, farm type, uh, small holding thing, and you've got dogs on the premises for protection. Then in that case, there's the leeway. Another one is what the ulama have also added in in today's time is a guide dog. So some people are blind and they don't have a, a guy, a personal person to take them around wherever they need to go. So some people walk around with a seeing eye dog, as they call it also. So the dog guides them around. That one also will be leeway from a Sharia perspective for those types, but not as a general thing. Now you've got a small house with no... Uh, uh, crime or problems around you but you want to have a dog and you want to come with a weak excuse of a loophole to say you know it's for protection protection against what protection against ants and uh, cockroaches is that what you ex you know you can lie to yourself you can't lie to Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given warnings against the person who keep a dog every day his rewards are, are lessened or and different things like this here on account of keeping a dog. And a, dog, a malaika don't enter a house wherein there's a dog. Now this, like I say, this hadith and things apply to a person who is not uh, qualified to have a dog. If you are the type that you have your dog looking after your sheep over there, your dog firstly will not be sleeping in your house. Your dog will be sleeping in his kennel where he belongs. Now, people have taken them and the dog sleeps in the bed with them and the dog licked them. The rules of the impurity of the saliva and the, of the dog and things remain in place regardless of what a purpose you use the dog for. So you can't go playing with the dog and rolling with your dog and have your dog in your house and he drinks from your glass and you eat and then he eats and then you eat the rest of the burger. It don't work that way. you messing with uh, Najasa over here, which is haram. So at the end of the day, we treat dogs with kindness, like we treat all the creatures of Allah, but the Sharia has given limited leeway with regards to permissibility, permissible interaction with dogs. So we stick to that. We don't go beyond that point. And anyway, coming to the point here, before I spend the entire night on this one hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then said, When the dog has drank from the container, walaga means, you know, like uh, he put his tongue, because that's how they, they work, they lick the water up with their tongue. So when he puts when he puts his tongue into the water to lick the water, then then wash this container seven times, and uh, wipe it out the last time with sand so uh for the eighth time meaning seven washes one time with sand uh, seven times with water one time with sand eight in total this is the uh, narration of your muslim rahimahullah muslim and that's the end of that chapter now to put things quickly into perspective you have a hadith which mentions uh, wash it seven times 
one time with sand. So uh, when you want to put, uh, meaning seven, including the sand, and the sand can come anywhere. Then you have another one which mentions, wash it, uh, wipe it first with the sand and then wash it seven times. And then you have, uh, wash it seven times and once with sand and wherever you, the sand fits in, the sand fits in. So you have different, different uh, narrations like this here. And uh, as you can see, this hadith was reported by Hadrat Abdullah ibn Mughafal radiyallahu anhu. It's not the same one of Hadrat Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu as before. But anyway, long story short, coming to the conclusion over here, what we do say is that it is good and mustahab. If you have the means, wash your container seven times. We, no, we're not going to say don't wash it. Many times people get the wrong uh, idea. When we uh, speak from a point of... Uh, technical fiqh uh, side of things, we say, this is what, you know, for example, uh, farad of wudu, washing a quarter of the head. That is farad. Doesn't mean only wash a quarter of your head. And sometimes people get this wrong impression. So uh, you wash the arm up to and uh, including the elbow. So never go beyond that limit. And we did that hadith inside here about, uh, you know, uh, Isbahul Wudu, that you wash, you know, washing beyond the limits. If you go on to YouTube, on to the, uh, either you can go to the old uh, channel, the Ummah Radio uh, channel, or you can go to the Darul Ilm channel on YouTube. Uh, both of them had some recordings of the Alao Sunan. And I had titled a video over there, one of the class things, as Washing Beyond the Limits. And that, uh, if you don't know the ruling regarding it, but anyway, so we say, Farad to wash at least that much. Sunnah mustahab, or at least I should say mustahab, which is more rewarding, is to wash beyond that point. So in a like many years, we say bare minimum is to wash uh, three times. If you wash five or seven times, all the better. Very good. But we're not saying don't wash seven. We're saying you are not required to wash seven. So, But if you do, all the better. So that's how we accept all of the ahadith. We say that how Hazrat Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu, being the narrator of both ahadith, his personal practice showed us as well that the wujub, the ruling of the obligation was to wash it at least three times. To wash it beyond that point is mustahab. So therefore, uh, if it's, uh, Sahaba were washing seven times, that is good and in its place. And thus, this hadith of Hadrat Abdullah ibn Mughafal radiyallahu anhu is understood in that light that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was saying, this is on the highest form. If you want to wash it in the best manner, then you wash it seven times and you finish it off the last eighth time with, a, with some sand. But if you only wash it three times, that too is established from the sunnah and it's perfectly fine. So that's how we put all of the ahadith in its perspective. So like I was saying earlier, I don't want to take too much time on the topic, even though we can spend whole night on the issue of dogs, but... Like I was saying, the ruling from a Shari'i perspective, if you happen to have a dog for whatever reason, your dog will be out in the kennel, you will not keep that dog in the house. The only time, the only time you can still try and find some sort of excuse is if there's a man who is blind and the dog helps him around inside the house because he can't find his way around anywhere. Let's assume that were to be a, a, a real case like that, and the dog can actually help him around. Generally, the dogs are for outside. A person who's blind, who can function and move around like this, generally knows where everything is inside the place. That's a, a norm. So anyway, in that case, then the dog will also stay outside, as is the, the rule. So regardless of what, and it especially people have children now you want to have your child play with the dog outside and things you know that is not the way that things are supposed to be done like i say we don't oppress uh, uh, the animals and creatures of allah but we don't take them as a uh, man's best friend type thing either so if a dog licks you you are required to wash you, your hand, your clothing, whatever it is. So if the dog licks your hand, you wash your hand three times, minimum. If you wash it seven times and then afterwards sand also, well, all the better. But if you wash it three times, that is sufficient. If a dog happened to lick a, a part of your clothing, then that part which was licked, that part alone needs to be washed. Some people think the dog licked my sleeve. I must throw my clothes in the wash now. No, you only need to wash that particular part which was licked. 
So that's how it works. So the saliva of the dog is impure. Now the point over here as well, we'll do this probably at the later stage in time in the other kitabs, inshallah ta'ala, but we don't know will we be alive until that point. So that's why I'm mentioning some of the rulings now. Another thing is the body of a dog by itself is not something which is impure. Now, sometimes, you know, you come to somebody and they happen to have a dog and they're like, don't worry, it's friendly. They, they always like to make such statements. It's friendly, it won't bite. And the dog is very jumping, putting its, fo its paws on you, uh, brushing up against you. That is not Najasa. The paws and the fur of a dog is not Najis. So if it had touched you like this here, there's no impurity involved. You don't have to wash those parts at all. Unless, of course, it was tramping in something dirty and put that on you. Unless it was, uh, 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 for example, uh, was rolling in its own saliva and rubbed that saliva uh, on you with its fur. That's a different story. But that's never going to happen in a normal situation. So sometimes people think, if a dog just brushed up against me, I need to go and bath. No, you don't need to. You don't have to even wash that clothing at all because it's not deemed as being impure. It is the saliva of the dog which is impure, not the whole dog itself. So anyway, like I said, I don't want to take too much time on the topic. That's the end of the chapter with regards to the saliva of dogs. I hope that uh, we've covered that point, inshallah ta'ala, sufficiently. But if there's any questions, like I always say, you're more than welcome to ask your questions at any point in time. You don't have to wait until the class is over before you ask your questions. Anyway, let's move quickly on to the next point. We've got a couple of minutes over here. So I hope we can do the next few ahadith and finish this next chapter, which is Babu Karahati Su'ril Hirri Tanzihan. The chapter that the leftover water of a cat is Makru Tanzihi. Makru Tanzihi. Um, one opinion, at least I should say, is that it is makru tanzihi. And there's also uh, rulings in this regard, specifics, which will be touched upon shortly. But you can generally understand that the leftover water of a cat is pure. Let's go with that one. Just in case we don't finish the entire chapter or something happens for us to cut out during the course of the class. So anyway, first hadith, hadith number 253. Hadrat Aisha radiallahu anha said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said with regards to the cat, inna laysat binajisin, that the cat is not impure, it's not najis. You know, uh, the, a cat is like one of the members of the family. And here's the thing. We are cat people. We are not dog people. So the cat is like one of the uh, uh, the people of the household. Like, you know, like uh, you got your toddler crawling around there. You got your cat also walking around there. So we are cat people and we are happy to be cat people. So here, the cat is like one of the members of the family. So there's no impurity about it. يعني الهرة meaning the cat Imam Ibn Khuzayma رحمه الله reports this hadith in his sahih meaning what you understand from this is that Imam Ibn Khuzayma graded it as being sahih and he put it in his sahih Moving on to the next hadith عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال يغسل الإناء إذا ولغ فيه الكلب سبع مرات أولى هن أو أخرى هن بالتراب وإذا ولغت فيه الهرة غسل مرة غسل مرة رواه الترمذي وقال آه هذا حديث حسن صحيح This is a, supposed to be هذا not, not a ha but a ha So Hadrat Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه And this is one of the ahadith I was making reference to previously Hadrat Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه reports that Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم said that a container is to be washed if a dog drinks from it it will be washed seven times the first time or the last time is to be done with sand So is the sand part of the seven or is this, the sand the eighth one? So first uh, sand, then seven washes, or is it seven washes, then sand, or, you know, like I just mentioned previously, you have it from this hadith over here. Then uh, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went further and says that if a cat drinks from your container, then wash it one time. Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah reports this hadith and he says it is a hasan sahih, in other words, it's a totally authentic hadith. So. Here we have one which says there's no nudges in it. Here we have one which says you wash it only one time. Now, I can uh, spend a lot of time on the explanation of this hadith here, but to simplify matters and to not take up a, a, a unnecessary amount of time, we say that when you are needing to wash a container, is you're going to wash it anyway. So like you would drink from a glass and you wash it once, 
Likewise, when the cat drinks from it, you wash it once. That's it. Finish end of story. And you'll see from further ahadith that there's absolutely no problem. You don't have to pour anything out or anything of that sort when it comes to a cat drinking from your container. And furthermore, the only time you really need to wash something is if you just saw your cat come in now and he throws a, a dead mouse down there for you to come show you, uh, give you a, a present. So he throws a mouse dead and, at your feet and he meows there for you. Then you see the blood now on, on it and it goes now to drink from the container. Then in that case, it's impurity. And if it, the cat licks you in that case with the blood on him, then in that case, that part is impure because the, of the blood. Not the cat, not its saliva, but the blood, the impurities that it was busy involved with. So that's the ruling with regards to cats. Otherwise, by and large, a cat is a pure creature. Let's move on to the next hadith, hadith number 255. عن كبشة ابنة كعب بن مالك رضي الله عنها وكانت عند ابن أبي قتادة أن أبا قتادة رضي الله عنها دخل عليها قالت فسكبت له وضوءا قالت فجاءت هرة تشرب so uh, Kabsha, she was the daughter of Hadr uh, Ka'ab ibn Malik رضي الله عنه and uh, she was uh, under ibn Abi Qatada she was uh, she was by Ibn the son of Hadrat Abu Qatada رضي الله عنه and uh, what least I should say she was married to Hadrat uh, Abu Qatada رضي الله عنه son so he, she said that Hadrat Abu Qatada رضي الله عنه who entered upon her and قالت so she's now the narrator she said فسكبت له وضوءا I poured for him a container of a bowl of water for him to make wudu with Wadu is the container which you make wudu from. So, Qalat, so uh, Kabsha, she said that the container was there for Hazrat uh, Abu Qatar uh, to make wudu, and then a cat came along. One of the Ahlul Bayt, uh, uh, you know, he just happens to be living in the house there. Hey, yes, some water for me. So, it walked over. And he started to do drink the water. Other Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu was sitting right there, uh, ready to make his wudu when the cat walked up. None plus, not bothered about anybody who's going to tell me uh, I walk in and I drink with your water. So he came over right there in front of Hadrat Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu and he began to drink from the water. So Hadrat Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu, he now tilted the container because you can understand the cat was uh, having to bend its head to fit it into the bowl to drink. So Hadrat Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu, he tilted the bowl at an angle so that the water can reach the lip, making it easier for the cat to drink. So the cat drank its full and then it went on its merry way. Qalat Kabsha, Fara'ani anzuru ilayhi. So uh, Kabsha, the narrator uh, who's narrating this whole incident, she said, so she, she, uh, Abu, she saw that uh, she recognized uh, or realized that Hadrat Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu saw her, that she was watching like, uh, why are you pouring the bowl, uh, tilting the bowl for the cat to drink? So. فقال أتعجبين يا ابن أخي. so she said, uh, are you uh, amazed and astounded at my, what I just did now? oh my knees. فقلت نعم. so she said yes I am. فقال إن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إنها ليست بنجس إنما هي من الطوافين عليكم أو الطوافات. رواه ترمذي وقال حسن صحيح. So Hadrat Abu Qatada رضي الله عنه he replied now to Kabsha and he said that Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم said that cats are not impure they are from the tawafin عليكم أو الطوافات. Another narration mentioned tawafin عليكم what tawafat. So tawafin plural masculine, those uh, who go around you, tawafat, plural feminine. So uh, cats are not impure. They are male or female. They are those creatures that are always around you. They come in your houses, they eat your food, they drink your water, they live with it, they sleep on your bed, they scratch your couches. You know, they, they're just part of the, the family uh, over there. So they are not impure. So that's why he physically poured, the, uh, tilted the bowel for the cat to drink. And the, what it tells you is that he then used the water to make wudu after that. Hence so why this hadith comes into the chapter of wudu. So even though the narration don't mention, he then made wudu with it. But you understood that the water was poured for wudu. And he did this. Otherwise, there would be no mention because then he could have thrown the water out and then we get, got new water. But no, we understand from this that he made wudu using that uh, water itself. Okay, so let's see. Two more hadith. Maybe we can still finish it off. Okay, next one is uh, 256. Anas ibn Malik, 
Uh, okay, time is running quite short. Uh, we may be cut off before then. So if you do happen to have any questions, ask it before the time runs out. So Hadar Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu, he said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out to a place known as Badhan in Medina. Faqali ya Anas, uskub li wadu'an. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, oh Hadar Anas radiyallahu anhu, pour for me some water for wudu. Fasakibtu lahu, so I poured uh, some water. Falamma qaba Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hajatahu, aqbala ila al-ina. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had relieved himself, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now came heading towards the container. Waqada atahirun fawalaga fihi al-ina. And as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was coming along, a cat came along and there the cat came to stand and drink from the water. So, فَوَقَفَ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَقْفَةً حَتَّى شَرِبَ الْهِرَ So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa stood and waited, waited until the cat had drank finish. ثُمَّ تَوَضَّأَ then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made wudu from that same water. فَذَكَرَ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ فَذُكِرَ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَمْرَ الْهِرِ so it was mentioned, meaning Hadrat Anas radiyallahu anhu himself then was the one who mentioned to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that the cat had just come and drank from the water now. Faqala, and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Anas, inna al-hirra min sibai al-bayti lam lay yaqdira shay'an wa lay yanjashu. Oh, Hadrat Anas radiyallahu anhu, verily the cats are from the wild uh, creatures of the house, uh, siba uh, means like, you know, lions and tigers and those sort of things. So when you're talking about your wild cat here in the house, that's where your cats are. So they lay yaqdiya shay'an, they make nothing dirty. Walayyan jashu, nor do they make it anything make anything impure. So they are pure, they are clean. If they drink from it, no problem. So Hadrat Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu previously, that hadith was doing the same thing that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa did here. In other words, he understood this as being a, 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 an action of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well, even though it's not mentioned in so many words over there. Imam al-Tabarani fi al-Saghir wa fihi Umar ibn Hafs al-Makki wa thaqahu ibn Hibban wa qala al-Zahabi la nadri man huwa. Kada fi majma'i al-Zawail qultu al-ilmu muqaddamun ala al-jahal ala anna al-ikhtilaf ghayra mudarrin kama urifa miraran. So principle of uh, hadith uh, over here, he says, Imam Al-Tabarani rahimahullah reports this hadith in Al-Mu'ajam Al-Saghir. In the narration is a person by the name of Umar ibn al-Hafs al-Makki. Imam ibn al-Hibban rahimahullah grades me as being thika, reliable, no problem with him at all. Imam Dhabi rahimahullah said, I, you know, I don't know who is this man. We don't know who he is. Who is Umar ibn al-Hafs al-Makki? So Mulana uh, Zafar Ahmad Tanmi says, uh, this is a principle of usul uh, al-hadith. He says, al-ilm muqaddamun ala jahl. If somebody say, I know this man, and another one say, I don't know him, then we're not finding fault with the one who says he don't know him. Not everybody knows everyone. But Imam Ibn Hibban obviously knew him if he graded him as being trustworthy and reliable. So therefore, the one who has explained why he accepted the person his uh, uh, view is given precedent of the one who says, I don't know who this is. Because you're speaking, for, and you are right to say, I don't know who he is, so uh, narration has some weakness. But the others say, no, we know who he is, so he's trustworthy, reliable, so there's no problem with the narration. So even from that usuli perspective of hadith, there's no problem. But Mulana Zafar Ahmad Tanvi, like he says, like we've mentioned many times, if one muhadith grades a narration as being authentic and another one grades it as being uh, not authentic, it's neither here nor there. It's suitable, uh, uh, perfectly fine for you to still accept it as is. Last one quickly before our time runs out, 257. حدثنا ابن أبي داود قال حدثنا الربيع ابن يحيى الأشناني قال حدثنا شعبة عن واقد ابن محمد عن نافع عن ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما أنه قال لا توضأوا من سؤر الحمار ولا الكلب ولا السنور فهو الطحاوي قلت رجال وثقات والربيع مختلف من رجال الصحيح والاختلاف لا يضر So Imam Ibn Abi Dawood narrates from Rabi Ibn Yahya Al-Ashnani from Shu'bah from Waqid Ibn Muhammad from Imam Nafi, the freed slave, from Hadrat Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, who said, do not make wudu from the leftover water of a donkey, meaning if you have water and a donkey drank from it, or a dog drank from it, or a sinur. Now, sinur, you can have two uh, understandings from this, but let me read the rest. Imam Tahawi rahimahullah narrates this hadith. Imam Zafar Ahmad Tan says, the narrators are all uh, reliable, trustworthy. Rabi'i. Rabbi Ibn Yahya al Ashinani, he's a Mukhtarafi narrator. The, uh, some Muhadithin grade him as being reliable and you know that sort of thing. And he's Min Rijali Sahih, he's from the uh, uh, authentic people. And he's saying, in any case, like you know, uh, the, 
like we just mentioned a moment ago, if one grades me or authentic and another one grades me not authentic, it doesn't harm the narration itself. So coming to the issue itself, what is a sinur? Now, I was mentioning over here, you get two things. One, you'll find some ulama who translate this simply as being cat. Other ulama say, no, this is a wild cat. You know, you got those cats and they've got like little tufts of hair on the tips of their ears. They like, uh, if you mix a wild, a literal wild cat, if you check the, the what a wild cat is, those cats that live out there, not in people's houses, that one, though that's the one which is referred to as a sinor, not the cat that's in the house. So two interpretations, one, it refers to the cat in the house, other one, it refers to that one out there. So we say, yes, fine. The one that's out there, obviously, you're not coming home with a packet of whiskers and, and things like this, or uh, giving it your tuna out of a can. That cat out there has to hunt for its prey and kill things, and that's how it eats. Nobody's coming there to feed it uh, berries and things. So obviously, it's going to be catching field mice and stuff and killing those sort of stuff. So if it drinks from your water, you know, don't make wudu from it. But your normal tawafin, the ones that live in your houses, there's no harm if they drink from it, unless you've explicitly seen that here he comes along having drank of uh, or having killed something, and now he's coming to drink from your uh, water with the blood all over it. So that's how we understand and put all the hadith in its correct uh, places. There's no contradiction between any of them. Uh, one additional point over here sometimes you come up along with people and they say you cannot sell a cat the uh, price uh, the money is not permissible and things that narration makes mention of the same word here the sinur so therefore the some like i say other ulama mentioned different narrations and to e explain away the uh, supposed impermissibility but like i say other ulama will simply say that sinur don't mean the cat in your house. So if you were to buy and sell kittens that comes from your house, there, there's no harm in that either. So long story short, at the end of the chapter, our time is just about out. Uh, just to summarize once again, saliva of dogs are impure, saliva of cats are pure. If the cats are licking you, uh, they hardly ever going to be doing that. They're more likely going to be biting you. But uh, anyway, the saliva is pure. They can lick your hand. Uh, they can eat your rice. Uh, they can, you can give him a bowl of biryani. It's not a problem. Obviously, just make sure you can eat the biryani. Don't harm him because you've got uh, uh, all spice and clothes and every type of thing inside there that can uh, that don't work with its uh, diet. But at the end of the day, you don't have to wash your plate now because your cat was sitting on the chair next to you eating with you. It's not a problem. But if a dog happened to do it, it will not be allowed because you would then be uh, you eating najasa because you're having a dog sit there and, uh, you know, he bites your burger, you bite the burger. Uh, that won't be allowed. But like I say, if it was a cat doing it, we got no problem with that. So long story short, that's how the ruling is. Cats are pure. Saliva of dogs are impure, and okay, we didn't get into the next chapter, so we'll do that chapter next time, inshallah ta'ala. Our time is just up for tonight, inshallah, so we end on this point here. Until next time, we end and we say, wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad, subhanallahi wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.